Hello there everybody and welcome to the Mr. Sin channel. Today we're doing our agricultural review. This video is going to be going over almost everything that we've talked about in the ag unit. We're even going to be talking about stuff that we didn't get to cover in class. So sit back and relax as we review our entire unit. Now this is going to be a long video so make sure you are taking notes. I'll have guided notes available for this video. You can find them in the description below. The notes will go along with everything that I'm talking about. Also, if you're watching this live on YouTube Premiere, welcome. I hope this helps you out. Make sure to use the chat during the video. Remember, you can always rewind and go back to the video. If you're watching it live though, one of the cool things is you can watch along with everyone else. And I'll be there answering questions throughout the whole thing. If you aren't watching this live, fear not. If you have any questions, you can post them in the comments below and I'll try to get to them as soon as I can. So enough of me talking, let's start to figure out what's going on with our agricultural unit and how can we make sure that we're all prepared for the egg test in AP Human Geography. On the screen right now, you can see all the content that I'm going to be going over during this video. There's a ton here. There's a lot of information. This video isn't going to have a bunch of pictures and flashy animations. The goal of this video is to try and make sure that you're best prepared for your agriculture test for human geography. So I'm going into a lot of content. In order to make sure that this video helps you, I want to make sure that you are actively learning. That means you are participating throughout the video, whether it be you watching live right now or at a later date and using the chat or comments or using your notebook and taking notes or using my guided notes that I've created that go along with the video. You do something that will help you better understand the content. There's a lot of information here and you don't want to get overwhelmed. By just sitting here and watching it, as you can see, there's a lot here you'll get overwhelmed and you won't remember as much. Also, if you're watching this live, remember you can't fast forward, but you will always be able to go back and rewatch it. So try to stay live as much as possible. That way you can keep asking questions. You can always come back to the stuff later if you need to take notes. And if you're watching this after it's premiered, feel free to skip around the video. Hopefully this screen helps you see exactly where the information is being shown, so that way you can get exactly what you need when you need it. And you can use your studying time more efficiently. Now enough of me talking and explaining this video, let's start to explore agriculture. Starting off by just what is agriculture? That's going to be important for us to understand if we're going to talk about agriculture for the next who knows how long. Now this whole unit has been about agriculture. Now not just about food, but we've talked about the government, we've talked about economies, we've talked about culture, we've talked about different people and groups and different societies and how they view agriculture and the production of food. Agriculture comes down to the deliberate modification of the earth's surface through cultivation of plants and rearing of animals to obtain substance or economic gain. So we've been talking about how we produce food essentially, whether it be livestock or whether it be grains and how different cultures and different environments produce and create certain food types. We've also gotten into as well throughout this unit of just diets and how culture impacts that along with the economic wealth of a society. Today over 97% of the farmers in the world are actually located in LDCs. Remember LDCs are less developed countries. You're going to be hearing that throughout the video and that's going to be important to understand. The next thing that right now that we're going to get into is kind of look at how agriculture has evolved over the years. This is another important thing because this is how we as a society, as a human species, have been able to survive and thrive over the years. All these different agricultural revolutions have made it possible for us to be able to grow as a species and also make sure that we can feed our growing population. So the hard thing with figuring out exactly when agriculture truly started is we have to go so far back in time that we don't have written records. So it's really hard for us to pinpoint that exact moment of when we saw our first agricultural revolution or when we first saw agriculture take off. Now we can use some educated assumptions and guesses based on information that we have. And what we've been able to figure out is before agriculture, we know for sure that we have hunters and gatherers. If you remember probably back to a world history class you may have taken where we talked about bands of people. Normally people are going to be traveling with around 50 people in a tribe or a small band. And the reason why it's going to be around 50 or less is because without 
agriculture. Without a food surplus, we don't have actually enough food to be able to support a larger population. Even if we connect back to our demographic transition model from our population unit, we know this is stage one, where we're going to see a very fragile society. Now, we still have some people in the world today that are actually participating and practicing in hunting and gathering lifestyles. You can see them on the screen right now. However, this accounts for 0.005% of the world's population. The majority of people have switched on and have moved forward from hunting and gathering. Now we still have people though, practicing in a couple different regions. Now our first agricultural revolution happened with the Neolithic Revolution. This is really important. This is where we started to see agriculture take off for the first time. The first agricultural revolution happened around 8000 BC. This was actually after the Ice Age, where we started to see new parts of the world become available to people. The reason why is as the ice started to rescind and we started to see more land become available and more land that we could actually live on, and environmental factors had changed. This allowed then new areas for people to move to. This first agricultural revolution kind of happened a little bit by accident. This is where we started to see domestication of animals and plants and started off as simple as people throwing old food away, realizing that, oh, there's stuff growing out of our trash that we just threw away. Hmm, I wonder why that is. Oh, if I start throwing these seeds, what starts to happen? Well, down the road, all of a sudden stuff's growing from them. Oh, if I put dirt over it and all of a sudden now it rains, oh, I get more crops growing. And so it's kind of an accidental discovery. We also though had not just environmental factors that made this possible, but some cultural ones. People started to want to settle down. They wanted to sit. They wanted to stay in one area. And as we started to see our populations fluctuate more and eventually start to grow a little bit, it became a necessity to have more food and a stable food source. Hunting and gathering, remember, being nomadic was not that sustainable. It's hard to be able to feed everyone. And it's also hard if you get sick to be able to carry on. We also started to see that this, again, this accidental discovery of the seeds, which made that possible. So we see this big shift happen. We're starting now to move from nomadic to sedentary lifestyle. This is this Neolithic revolution, and it is huge. This is where we start to see also some division between people. Because now not everyone has to just be a farmer or they don't have to all just be someone who is hunting and gathering. Because we now have a food surplus, we do have farmers. We are gonna have now people doing other tasks because we can develop a food surplus. And this is where we start to get into the division and the ranking of different people and where some people, we read the article about Jared Diamond, actually view this step in our human history as a big mistake because now we are starting to get inequalities that develop because people are gonna be treated differently, because they'll have different jobs, different worth and value, all because now we have enough food. And so people are able to start doing different things. And while inequality and class division is not necessarily the best thing, we do have it now possible for us to have complex societies, population booms. Our lifestyles have changed significantly now. People are also gonna to start to live a little bit longer. So there's a lot of good that came out of the first agricultural revolution as well as some negative things. And not just food and lifestyles change. We started to see crop hearths take off as more and more crops were discovered. And as those origins, remember hearth referencing kind of the origin of where it started, started to expand with the diffusion of these crops, which then changed other societies. So on the screen right now, you can see all of the different crop hearths and also our animal hearths. These are being displayed on the screen because I'm not gonna read through them all for you. You can read it yourself and this way it'll help keep the video a little bit shorter. But hopefully this will make sure that you can use your time better for when studying. So make sure to take notes on these. You can come back to this part of the video whenever you want or you can also just pause it. But one thing is certain here. We don't know how all these things diffuse throughout the world. We don't know how agriculture diffused. Now we can make some inferences and some educated guesses and some things we do have a little bit of an understanding of. But agriculture happened so long ago, we don't know how it spread. But it is important to understand that as it spread and diffused, we started to see it change based on the cultures and where it diffused too. Even these crops had a major impact, and also the livestock, of where they were located, where they started and eventually spread from, because that 
created a culture and society around some of the food. It let some areas grow their population quicker than others. It let some also create a more stable society. So it's important to understand that while agriculture spreads and while these crops diffuse, they did have some pretty big impact on the world around them. And at the same time too, we don't know exactly how agriculture did diffuse. So again, if you need more time looking at the different animal or crop purse, you can see them on the screen, make sure to pause the video. I'm going to go on to the next section though so we can keep the video going. Hopefully so far this is going pretty well and it's more of a review instead of learning everything for the first time. So we might not know exactly when agriculture was officially created and spread and diffused throughout the world, but we do know some different historical things that happened that did speed up the process and help the transfer of certain goods or the diffusion of certain goods throughout the world. Things like the Silk Road, which connected the East and West, Asia all the way to Europe, in the Middle East, where we started to see new farming techniques spread throughout. Also the diffusion of crops throughout those trade routes. As they continued to go down and be spread, this started to impact different lifestyles of people who were trading there. We also saw the slave trade, the Colombian exchange, which brought a ton of new crops to the new world and old world. Actually, part of that helped stabilize Europe's population and allow for even a further population boom. And colonialism just in general, as we started to see European countries spread throughout the world, trying to gain access to new resources, all the while giving some of their resources to their conquered areas and taking some of those back to Europe. These different historical events had a huge impacts because as we continue to become more connected, as globalism slowly started to become created, we started to see the diffusion more of animals, of crops, and just even different techniques and styles as we saw people moving and spreading ideas throughout the world. All these different things helped develop the agriculture that we know today. And it wouldn't be possible to have what we have now if it wasn't for these events in the past. The next agricultural revolution is number two, the second agricultural revolution. This one's also sometimes referenced as the British agricultural revolution. And that's because it starts with the industrial revolution, which started in Britain. Now, this happens around 1750 to the 1900s. And what's happening here is we see a lot of new ideas and technologies take off. From the seed drill to Elon Whitney's cotton gin, all these make it possible to produce more at a faster rate. The other thing that happened too in Britain was the enclosure movement. This is a really significant thing because what had happened before was farmland and just land in general was kind of communally owned. Everyone grew what they needed to for themselves to support their own family and that was about it. So everyone was working the land together. What happened in the enclosure movement is people realized, hey, we can actually be a lot more efficient if we buy all the land and then we just produce for ourselves and we can mass produce that. Now we started to see mass production take off in the industrial revolution, but this enclosure movement took all these small farms, all these small areas, put it all as one large field that was going to produce certain crops to create a surplus and sell it for profit. What happened then is we saw a bunch of farmers and local people who had originally been living off of this land get kicked off and they had to now go to urban areas. This created then also a population boom because we started to see more food being produced. It turns out that whenever in history we start to see the consolidation and people actually now just working for themselves instead of for just the community, they become more productive. You're more willing to produce more food and to become more efficient if you can make more of a reward. Whereas when we saw the communal style, well, there wasn't as much of an incentive. So people just grew food for themselves. And even in the 18th century, what started to happen with livestock yield, they started to double the weight of them because now we are becoming more efficient. And they're also trying to incentivize their workers and the people working their land to sell bigger and healthier animals so they can get more money. All of this continues to then support a population boom. So this second agricultural revolution happens with the industrial revolution and it's big. This is now where we start to see the production of food dramatically increase. At the same time though, we're also going to see our population increase as well. And so that'll run into other issues down the road. After the enclosure movement, we started to see crop rotation become very prevalent in Britain as well. All these things too diffuse throughout the world. 
Crop rotation, remember, is when you're going to plant certain crops in sections of your land one year, and then the next year you'll plant something different. You'll rotate the crops throughout your land, that way you don't take all of one nutrient out of the land. You also maybe will let the land follow sometimes to be able to just replenish and you wouldn't be planting crops that year. Now, as the world started to develop and our second agricultural revolution occurred during the Industrial Revolution, we started to see globalization truly emerge. We now are seeing advancements in technology and also transportation. This is creating new markets for us to be able to sell goods and to be able to purchase goods from. And food was a major good that was traded. We started to see ships that can now transport items easier. Trains are now becoming connected and connecting cities and rural areas. And we're also seeing canals be built that make it easier to transport all these goods. All of this leads to new markets, new efficiencies, and new ways for us to get products in and out of our businesses, our homes, and our shops, which lets people buy more and is going to then let population continue to increase. This is now the start of a globalized world as things are starting to become very connected. So technology as it advances helped continue to connect the world and continue to advance agriculture along with it. Now, as time went on, we started to see population growth continue to grow, but our agriculture output was not growing at the same rate. This is where we started to see Thomas Malthus come in and say different things like, the world is going to end because we're going to run out of food. He didn't think we could continue to produce more. All of this gets proven wrong in our next agricultural revolution, which is the Green Revolution. This happened around the 1970s, 1980s, where researchers were actually able to start to figure out new ways to produce food. We're able to increase our output again. And what happened is we were able to take things from the lab and bring it into the field. We started to see two main practices go into effect where we started to see one, our introduction of higher yielding seeds. So starting to manipulate seeds a little bit to produce higher yield for farmers, which then let more crops be produced. And also our second practice was the use of chemicals and fertilizers which then also increased our yield. So we started to see new changes going from a lab to a field, which made it possible to increase our food output. Now in some parts of the world, this dramatically increased the output and stopped people from starving and dying. And now we started to see our food production skyrocket along with our population growth which is a great thing. Again, kind of proving Thomas Malthus wrong. As more people started to think about the issues at hand, we were able to come up with new ideas to be able to counter this food crisis. During this green revolution, we started to see new creations, especially in the seed market. The miracle wheat seed was actually created during this time. The miracle wheat seed is really important for our history because it saved billions of lives. Now, what this seed did is it changed a little bit of how wheat was grown. The miracle wheat seed was actually shorter. The stalks were stiffer. They were able to mature faster. They responded better to fertilizer and they were less sensitive to changes in day. Now, Dr. Mor Norman Borlaug was very significant in the research and development of this seed. He actually was won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970 for this development and is credited for saving billions of lives. His seed was used in Mexico and India and Pakistan. This made it possible for farmers to feed their growing populations. To illustrate just how important this miracle wheat seed was, we can look at India. India more than doubled their output of wheat within five years. In the mid-1960s, they were importing around 10 million tons of wheat. By 1971, they had a surplus of a couple million tons. This wheat seed saved their population and really dramatically shifted their economy. We also see in the 60s and 70s research being done in Indonesia to create a new hybrid dwarf rice seed, which would then increase yields and make them hardier, being able to survive in a variety of climates. All this stuff is happening during this green revolution, and this is why we start to see our agricultural output start to skyrocket as we start to use breeding of seeds to be able to produce higher yielding crops that then support our growing population. 
As the Green Revolution continued and as we entered further down the 19th century, scientists discovered that nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium were crucial elements in creating stronger and healthier seeds and improving their fertility. So these elements became staples in also our fertilizers. Now today they're still used. On the screen right now you can see China, Europe, and North America. You can see exactly kind of what they're doing with fertilizers today. Now one of the kind of unique issues that has started to come up in really just recent years has been the rise of gas prices. Now you might be wondering why would gas prices affect fertilizer? You're not going to put gas on a plant that's going to kill it, which yes, it probably would and I wouldn't recommend doing that. But for Europe and North America, they actually get a lot of their nitrogen from hydrogen from natural gas. So as gas prices have started to go up in price, it has become more expensive then to produce some of these fertilizers, which makes it so some farmers can't afford it, or we also start to see a slowdown in research. So this is more of a recent problem that is starting to occur with trying to get some of the chemical components to be able to create these fertilizers. So something to think about in the future. We'll have to see what happens if we see the creation of new fertilizers or if we start to move off of our traditional base as gas prices continue to go up. So the Green Revolution had a huge impact on the world. Some of it was really good, others could be argued as some negatives. We started to see the industrialization of farming where we can now have larger farms that produce more food, a decrease in family farms as more of these smaller farms got bought up and became part of a larger conglomerate of other farms or agribusiness, which will slowly start to develop over time as well. We started though to see also increased productivity. We are now producing more and more. We're producing at rates we've never been able to before, which means we have more people that we can feed. We also have new global markets that make it possible for us to have access to food that we've never had access to in history. We are able to transport food faster and quicker, and we start to also see some potential animal rights abuses. So now we start to see with livestock and how they're treated, especially when we get into industrialized agriculture, which we'll talk about later in this video, and the CAFOs. We also see a lot of benefits just as now people are being able to be fed. Now, some negatives there too are going to be those animal abuse, the loss of family farms, and maybe what some would say, uh, loss of the soul of some of the food. Meaning more, we're starting to produce as a product less of how are we growing healthy and natural food. And we're always trying to just produce more, but not think of some of the consequences. And some of those are up for debate. So it's kind of up to you on your thoughts there as well. But the Green Revolution, nonetheless, was extremely important and has created the world that we live in today. As you can see, throughout history, we've pushed the limits of what we can produce for food. Now, some are starting to argue that we are entering a fourth agricultural revolution, or that we're about to. Now, this one is going to be defined a little bit differently. Here, we're going to be looking at genetic modifications. We're going to be looking at robotics, vertical farming, all these different new techniques to be able to increase our output again. Now when we're talking about genetically modification here, one big difference from the Green Revolution is now we're going to be starting to modify some of these organisms in ways that they would not naturally breed. So we're going to be combining different things or even going into the chromosomes and DNA to be able to manipulate the structures to create that perfect product that we're trying to get. Now worldwide we've seen a shift slowly starting to happen. Today over 179 million hectares of land have been devoted to genetically modified crops. That's over 10% of the world's arable land. And we're starting to see too, especially with certain crops like soybeans, which over 77% of the world's soybeans are now genetically modified. Or cotton, where we're seeing 49%. Or even corn or maize, which is going to be around 26%, have all been genetically modified. And this is now where we're starting to see this possible fourth agricultural revolution. Others have argued that we're not there yet, but we need to get there quickly. The reason why is as our climate continues to change, we're seeing areas of the world that are becoming harder and harder to grow food. Just this past week, we've seen a report that's talked about Midwest for the United States, where we're starting to see a change in climate, which is going to make it very hard for the Midwest to continue to produce the crops they have. As we start to see more and more rain, along with warmer and warmer summers and winters, which are going to make it more difficult to produce crops. And that could have some really big negative impacts on just the survival of our species. So this agricultural revolution is going to be key if we're going to be able to find new ways to produce food to continue to feed our population. 
Now, since we're on the topic of genetically modified foods, we have to talk about the United States here. And not just because I'm from the United States and we're focusing on it, but the United States has actually been leading in genetically modified foods. For the United States, over 94% of our soybeans are genetically modified. Over 90% of our cotton is genetically modified. And over 88% of our maize is genetically modified. We have really pushed the bounds with genetically modified food. In fact, the United States accounts for over one half of the world's genetically modified food. And the U.S. has been trying to urge other countries to follow suit and to start using genetically modified foods. However, many countries have started to push back. Even regions of the world have really pushed back. Now, there's a bunch of different reasons why. Some have to do with cultural things, others have to do with health risks, and some are just they don't want to become dependent on some of these big businesses that operate within the United States. One region and area in particular is Africa. Now, opposition to genetically modified foods is pretty strong in Africa. Now, there's a bunch of different reasons why that is. The first one is actually going to be kind of a health concern issue. Now, this isn't just for Africa. It's also applying to Europe, people in the United States, and around the world. But a lot of people are concerned that by consuming large amounts of genetically modified foods, we might be starting to make it so our antibiotics are no longer as effective. Some of that comes to how food is raised, particularly focusing on livestock with the use of antibiotics in feed or also just in the animals themselves. And as we start to see this saturation of antibiotics and also this evolution occurring, we'll see these diseases start to maybe evolve to the point of where antibiotics will no longer work on them. So there's some health concerns and that will create a pushback. There's also an economic concern. One of Africa's biggest buyers of their food is the European market. Now the European market has pretty strict guidelines on GMOs or anything that's genetically modified. They have to be labeled, it has to be visible, and because of that, a lot of people there don't like genetically modified foods. So African farmers are worried if they start using genetically modified foods, they'll have to start labeling, that's gonna add cost to them, and they might also lose some of their customers. And they don't wanna risk that. So then if they did lose their customers, they're going to be in a pretty bad spot because they'll start to have food now that they don't have a place to sell. And so there's issues there. The other thing is also kind of a cultural and economic factor as well, which is the whole idea of relying on big business to be able to supply you with seeds and feed for all of your different crops or animals. One of the issues that comes up is Monsanto's. Now, Monsanto's doesn't necessarily exist anymore because of the merger with Bayer Chemical Company, and they're coming up with their whole new name, and that process is ongoing. But one of the things that happen is because they own the seed, that they own that concept of it, they can then tell farmers, you have to keep paying us every year because otherwise you're violating our patent. And there's a lot of kind of controversy with that. So a lot of places don't want to be reliant on a big business, particularly an American one. So there's some resistance there as well. Now, we'll have to see what happens fully with this next agricultural revolution. One thing is for sure, the world does need another step in this process of food. As our climate continues to change, it's only a matter of time before we start seeing more food shortages. We also need to become more efficient in just how we transport food. That food miles thing, we talked a little bit about it in class, and your readings and articles that we've looked at have also gone into it. But how we're transporting food, when food is spoiling, that's going to be important for us to also kind of get down and under control. Because if we can become more efficient in how we produce food, we can feed more people. And with more people being fed, we can have a more stable society and a happier life. Okay, you've made it through the first part of the video. We've talked about all the revolutions. We've talked about some of the hearths. We've talked about just what is agriculture. Relax a little bit, kind of shake it off, move the body around, do what you need to do right now. If you need to pause this video, pause the video. Now, if you're watching it live, try not to pause it so you can stay along with it, and that way you can keep asking questions. But remember, this is a lot of information for you to process, so make sure you're taking notes. Use the guided notes you can find in the description below. Use your notebook, whatever it may be. Be active in your learning, or just participate in the chat or the comments below. It's important for you to remember that you can do this. This is AP, this is hard stuff, and while I know not all of you like me, constantly reminding you, I do have faith in you, even if you're overwhelmed. So relax a little bit more. We're gonna now get into our next part, which is going to be Von Tunen. Great name, I don't know why it's so fun to say, especially like Dracula, Von Tunen, Von Tunen. Anyways, let's continue with the video as we're done with this little brain break. 
Again, relax, breathe, and let's go on to our next part now as we continue to learn about agriculture. Jonathan Heinrich von Thunen created this model of agriculture, the von Thunen model, and it was first proposed in his book, The Isolated State. One of the things that von Thunen noticed is that farmers that had the same land and also the same environmental factors were all using their land in different ways. And he was curious as to why that would be. Why are some farmers producing crop A and others are producing crop B or C? Now, what he started to discover is that there was some environmental and, but more importantly, economic factors at play. He created his hypothesis and he looked at the reason for these locations and he kind of boiled it down to two main things that farmers considered. One, what's the cost of the land? And two, what is the cost of the transportation of the goods they're producing? Everything had to do with money. Now, this is going to be really important for understanding the Von Thunen model and how it applies both to the past and also current day. On the screen right now, you can see Von Thunen's six assumptions. They're all listed right here. Now, these assumptions are what the model is based off of. Models, remember, are pretty complex. They're ways of us looking at a lot of information and trying to simplify it down. So a lot of times when we apply a model to real life, they're going to change and alter. That's why some of these assumptions, like the land is all uniform, while we know is not true in real life, had to happen for his model. This makes it so his model can be applied to whatever geographic area and makes it easier for us to use in the real world. So while some of these assumptions may seem kind of silly because obviously they're not true, it helps create his model and makes it more applicable for current day and also the past. Another thing to remember too is Von Thunen created this before the Industrial Revolution. So this is an older model and we'll be looking at how it's changed and evolved over time and if it's even relevant today. Now Von Thunen's model was based off the Germanic diet and also it's just focusing on commercial agriculture not subsistence. This is focusing on where farmers are wanting to make money. Now, one of the things that you have to understand is profit. So profit, in order for us to figure out how much we make, we'll take our market price, how much we can sell it for, and we'll minus our production costs. Now, the question though is what goes into some of these costs? Von Tuna noticed a couple different factors. When looking at it, we'll have to look at our labor, our equipment, and our transportation. Von Tuna noticed that bulkier products, heavier products, are harder to transport, which means they're going to cost more. That got factored into when he was creating this model. The other thing he started to notice was perishable products were also more expensive to transfer and transport. Reason why is they had to be taken care of in a certain way. And if they were left out in the open for too long, or if they were just essentially being used, and once they were produced, they would expire. And so you had to get to market really fast. So transportation costs were a little bit different there. The last thing that he looked at too is land and the value of land. What he noticed is as you started to move farther away from the city or your main market, land became cheaper. Now that kind of connects to supply and demand. We've referenced this multiple times on the channel before. The important thing to understand here is when you're in a city or in a major area, an urban sprawl, you're going to have limited access to land because we'll have a lot more people living there. So we have more people but less land. So what happens is people are still wanting to buy land, rent houses, buy places, and so the value of these things goes up. Where the further away you get from the city, land values go down because we have more land now and less people, which is meaning we're gonna see cheaper land. So that's at play in this model as well. Now, all these elements have to be considered when factoring in where to produce certain products, particularly with food, and that's where we get into the Von Thunen model. Now, before we get into this model and look at all the different rings, we have to go over the bid rent theory. Now, this theory will come up throughout the AP Human Geography course. So it's important to understand because we'll see it again pop up in our economic unit and even a little bit in our urban unit as well. The bid rent theory is just looking at the value of land. I've actually already explained the whole theory. What it is, is as we move further away from an urban area, our market, our city, land value will decrease. And that goes back to our supply and demand because we are going to see more supply of land and demand will go down because there's less people living out in the wilderness or farther away from that city, then we'll see land value go down. Where the closer you get to the city, the more expensive land will be. Think of it in real life. If you wanna live in New York City, San Francisco, Rochester, Minnesota, uh, Chicago, Houston, any major area, we're going to see higher prices because there's not as much available land. 
rent will be more expensive as there's fewer apartments that are available because of how many people are renting. Where if you live in a rural community, if you're in a small town, a village, a hamlet, these areas will have cheaper lands. They'll have cheaper rents. They'll have cheaper land that you can purchase. The reason why is there's less people and more available land. So it all comes back to supply and demand. Hopefully this is making sense. The important thing to remember with the bid rent theory is it has to deal with how far away we go from the city and that connection to then the value of the land. Now there is other factors that would change the land value based on certain resources they have or the quality. But the bid rent theory is just looking at the proximity to the market. How close are you to the main city? Further away you get, traditionally you're gonna have cheaper land values. Closer you get, land values will go up as we start to see a scarcity in land. Now you can see right now I have Von Tunin's model up. This is one of his original models. In the center, we're going to have our market. Everything's gonna revolve around the market because people want to sell here. Remember, farmers are focused on making money. So they're producing for the city, for the market, where they will be able to sell. Now, going out then, we have our dairy farming or intensive production. Now, the reason why this is so close is this is gonna be where all of our perishables are produced. If you remember back to some of our vocab, we have the milk shed. This is that ring of where you can produce milk before it expires. Over time, we've seen this expand as transportation and new technology has made it possible to be able to transport these perishables further and further. This is closest to the city because they had to get there very quickly. If you couldn't get it there fast enough, then the products expired. Going out from Von Tunes, we have the forest. Big reason why that's located there is because this is pre-industrial revolution. Wood is used to heat homes and to as fuel, just in general. And it's also really bulky, remember. We talked about that in the factors. It's hard to carry, it's expensive. So that has to be a little bit closer to our market. From there, we're gonna be seeing our grains and field crops. These are areas where, for the most part, it's pretty easy to transport. You can fill up a wagon or you can fill silos, you can store this food, it's not going to expire. You also need more land, so it's more important to have cheaper land here so you can grow your crops on large fields. Even further out, we have our ranching and livestock. Now, the reason why they're so far out is they can transport themselves. You could have a slaughterhouse closer to the city and you could have the cows walk there or you could have whatever agricultural products you're producing. This too is gonna to require a lot of land. Now this has changed a lot as our agriculture has become more industrialized and we've seen the rise of CAFOs, these confined animal feedlots come up. Now one of the things though back then is we had the Wild West, this range wars where we'll get into that later in the video. But the important thing just for now to remember is this is where we needed a lot of land. So you wanted to be further out. So it was pretty cheap. Now anything past this Von Tunin said was the wilderness. People might be living out there. There might be different things happening, but you're too far away from the market now to be able to produce a profit. Your transportation costs will be too high. You wouldn't make profit. And so people aren't going to be growing anything for at least commercial agriculture that will go to the city because now you're too far away. And over time, this model has shifted and changed a little bit. Now you can see kind of the updated one that's encompassing more variety in some of the crops. As you can see, there are some changes. This is more of current day. And Von Tunen's model still can apply to the world that we know, especially if we look at the United States and we pull up a map of that. We can see the rings, while they're not perfect rings, still are in, for the most part, the same order. It's kind of a cool model considering how old it is and yet it's still used and practiced today. Whether it be intentionally or unintentionally, Von Tunen was definitely onto something and he created something that has stood, for the most part, the test of time. Up next, we have subsistence and commercial agriculture. The important thing to remember here is that LDCs, less developed countries, are going to have more subsistence agriculture, while MDCs, more developed countries, are going to be using more commercial agriculture. Now, commercial agriculture is gonna be food that's produced for profit, you're selling it off the farm, while subsistence agriculture is food is being produced for people living on the farm. You're trying to feed your family or the people living with you. You're not making money. Now there's a couple di big differences between these two. One is the workforce, the actual size, two, the use of machinery, and also three, the size of the farm. 
Those are gonna be important to understand when looking at these different types of agriculture. And really these are main categories. We're not yet in all of the different types of agriculture like pastoral nomads, ranching, uh, slash and burn. We'll be getting to that a little bit later in the video. On the screen right now, you can see a bunch of different statistics for commercial agriculture and subsistence agriculture. The important thing here to understand is the main differences between these two types of agriculture. Commercial is going to have access to a lot of machines. They're going to have less of a workforce because they'll focus more with their agricultural density being lower on technology to be able to support their population. They'll also have better transportation, access to just technology, and it'll also be a little bit more expensive. Many farmers will actually go into debt who are producing in a commercial agricultural environment. And that's just because of how expensive it can be to be able to afford all this new technology, these innovations, and to be able to continue to produce. While subsistence agriculture, we can see, is actually going to have more of a workforce as more people do things by hand, less by machines. Animals are going to be used a lot more as tools to be able to help harvest or plant. And we're going to see, even if they do have access to some of these technologies or innovations, they might not have the money to be able to afford it. Transportation is also going to lack here. Now, one of the things that's important to understand with transportation, and I've referenced this earlier in the video, is with increased transportation, with better roads, better shipping ways and routes, we actually are able to gain access to more technology. We're able to gain access to new markets, which means I have more places to sell and I have more things that I can purchase. So that's why transportation is really important. So transitioning back to something I referenced earlier in this video, which is what we are actually eating. Now there's three main things that have kind of shaped how we eat food. Now, now I'm not just saying are we using chopsticks or forks or are we holding our food, are we using a plate? I'm referencing more of the types of food that society and cultures consume. It varies depending on where we are in the world. And we've seen three main things that show kind of an outcome of why a society might be eating some food but not others. Some of them have to do with just the level of development. People in more developed countries will have access to larger varieties of food, where people in less developed countries will have a smaller option. They're not going to have as many things to pick from. We'll also see that the physical condition impacts a lot. What can we actually grow there? What food is available to us? What's, able for, what's easy for us to produce? Now this has started to actually change. It's an interesting kind of phenomenon. As we've seen technology and transportation increase, now this has more affected more developed countries than less because they don't have access. But as we've seen these increases in transportation, we've seen new foods be introduced into markets that they never would have been able to have because we can transport foods quicker and faster now and also more reliable. The last thing is cultural preferences as well. Over time, societies have grown and created new social norms, new identities for their own cultures, and that has shaped how people eat and what people eat. Everything from insects like crickets all the way up to just eating meat and corn or soybeans, depending on where we live in the world, has a big impact of what we eat. Some people think that haggis is disgusting and you should never eat it. However, in places like Scotland, that's a staple food. While others think that tacos are the best thing. Everything varies on who you are and what you want to consume. But we can see that where we live has a big impact on what we find acceptable to eat or what we might find kind of gross and weird. And there's other factors at play than just our own taste buds and what we think we desire. As we continue to consume more food, our dietary energy consumption has been going up. Now it does depend on where you live in the world. Some areas have seen a bigger increase than others. Some have even seen a decrease. But our dietary energy consumption is just the amount of food that individuals consume. This is measured most often in kilocalories. Or if you're in the United States, it's going to be calories. Now for here, most humans are going to be consuming their kilocalories or calories, depending on what you're calling it, from grains. We're actually looking at cereal grains. This is grass that yields from grains for food. So one of the most important crops that we see here is our wheat, rice, and maize. These are going to account for nearly 90% of all grain production for the world. Now, some of these we eat more than others, and some of them are fed to our animals, and we're going to get into that in just a second. On the screen right now, you can see different crops that the world produces. These are major crops that are used, both for food for animals and for also people. These are where we're getting the majority of our kilocalories from. 
And it's important to understand how depending on where we live, there's different things at play and we're consuming and using these crops in different ways. Now, I'm not gonna read through everything on here. If you're watching this live, don't worry about pausing this or rewinding it right now. Follow along with the rest of the video and come back to these slides if you need them. If you don't need them, great, that's awesome if you already understand it. If you're watching this and it's already premiered, by all means, pause the video and kind of look through this. I'm not gonna read them all in the interest of time. The important thing here to understand though is that the majority of our protein for more developed countries is actually gonna come from meat. Now, less developed countries are gonna get most of their protein from cereal grains. That's a big difference. One really cool resource that I used in my class is the website that is posted on the screen right now. This is looking at the world and the consumption. We can see a bunch of different countries and where they're getting their calories from. You can see how it's changed over the years and you can see some of the averages. I'll put a link to the website in the description below. I would highly recommend checking that out for just seeing some basics of kind of what are people consuming? Where are they getting their calories from? How does this even connect into all the topics we've already talked about in this unit? You can see a lot of different things there. We can also see some things like culture that's playing a preference there. One thing that I forgot to mention a little bit earlier when talking about culture is religion. We'll see certain areas that won't produce or eat certain crops or animals because of religious customs. If you go onto the website and you look at India, you can see that pork production is very low. They're not consuming a lot. That has to connect into religion, where they're not gonna eat certain meats. So it's kind of interesting to see how our culture impacts what we eat and how what we eat impacts our culture and how all these things kind of develop and change the society that we live in today. Kind of actually interesting to think about. Are the food choices that you make every day based on just what you like or is that society having more of an influence over you that you don't even maybe realize? Hmm. Now, since we're talking about food and proteins and all this consumption, it's important to understand that the human body needs proteins, they need certain foods to be able to function and live a healthy life. Now, the UN has defined food security as the following. A physical, social, and economic access at all times to safe and nutritious food, sufficient to meet dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy lifestyle. Now, in the world, we see some variations depending on how much people are consuming. The UN, the average right now consumption worldwide is around 2,800 kilocalories per day. Now, if you live in a more developed country, in MDC, you're looking at around 3,600 kilocalories. In the United States, we're around 3,800, where less developed countries are looking at around 2,600 kilocalories. One of the important things to understand is when the body, especially depending on your age, it can affect you more, but when the human body is not getting enough nourishment, you become undernourished. And what happens is you can start to experience some developmental issues. If you're not eating enough food, that's gonna change how you're growing, how your brain is developing, and all these things have some consequences. So it's important for us to be able to support people throughout the world to make sure that they can have enough food so that they can develop and grow and become healthy healthy and active people in our world community. Unfortunately today, we have a lot of people that are struggling with getting food. And some argue it's not necessarily we're not producing enough, it's more we're just not using it wisely. That we produce more food than we ever have before, but a lot of it gets thrown out to food waste. Now we're not gonna get into all of that right now, I just don't have time, but it's an interesting thing to look at if you're curious on the whole food crisis and issue. Today, the UN estimates that we have over 870 million people who are undernourished. The majority of these people are in developing countries. They're in these LDCs. And the two countries that unfortunately have the most undernourished people are India and China. And that's also worrisome, especially when we're looking at population growth and where we're seeing more and more people be born when we have less access to food. And this could create other issues down the road. Now, it's not though just an issue for the developing world. The developed world, or MDCs, is also struggling. They have food deserts that are starting to pop up. Food deserts are areas where in a developed world, particularly urban areas, sometimes rural communities as well, there's no access to fresh food. They don't have the ability to be able to buy fresh produce. Or if they do have it, it's really expensive and most people won't be able to afford it. A lot of times we can see neighborhoods where there's no grocery store they're gonna have high rates of poverty and are going to be undernourished. 
this is going to create other issues, as most people in these areas will turn to fast food, gas stations, or other areas to get their food, which is less healthy. This has seen a rise in the obesity rate, which is leading to increased rates of diabetes and other health issues as well. So this is not just a problem that the underdeveloped world is seen, not underdeveloped necessarily, but less developed, and also not a problem that just the more developed world is seen. It's a thing that is impacting all parts of the world. Now, we're seeing it affect different ways, but it's important to understand that the world is struggling with food. And the question is, how can we fix this problem? And right now, I don't have an answer for you. We'll have to see if, over time, we see some progress made. And maybe, who knows? Could we solve global hunger? Perhaps. I mean, there's no reason why we couldn't. We made it to the moon. Why not solve hunger? Now, I know it's a big ambitious statement and we're going to move on because now I'm starting to ramble and I'm sure some of you are starting to get annoyed. So on to the next thing. Agriculture is practiced in different ways all over the world. Whitley's, and I might be butchering that name, discovered we had some main regions of where we see different agricultural practices happening. On the screen right now, you can see all of them, from pastoral nomads, shifting cultivation, to intensive substance agriculture with rice and without rice, and also plantations. We're going to be focusing at first just on the LDCs, the subsistence agriculture. And then I'll get into the MDCs, where we'll be talking about different types of commercial agriculture. So right now, you can see all the different regions of where these things are practiced, it's going to be important to understand these and know where they're happening. Because actually their location does impact why these things are happening in certain areas, but not others. So if you have questions, make sure to let me know and I can answer those for you. Otherwise, when you're looking at them, I'm going to be explaining now the different types of agriculture and you'll start to see why they're occurring in some regions, but not others throughout our world. Before we get into our first subsistence agriculture, which is going to be pastoral nomads, you need to take a break. This has been going on for a while. We haven't done this in a little bit. Stretch it out, relax, vent, do whatever you need to. Just calm down, breathe. It's going to be okay. Maybe this is making it worse. I don't know, but you need to take a break and you need to realize you can do this. Remember to continue to be active. Use the chat, comment below, use your notes, whatever you can do to stay focused to understand all this information. You can do this. I know you can, even if you don't wanna keep hearing it. So relax, if you need more time, by all means pause it. Again, if you're watching this live, try not to stay as current as you can. This will help you make sure that you can ask questions. You can always go back later on. Now, enough of me talking, the break is over, breathe, you can do it, remember you can do it, and let's continue on with the wonderful review. So pastoral nomads are a really interesting group. This originally was seen as kind of an evolution to hunters and gatherers in between then sedentary agriculture. However, over time, this has started to change. People have realized this is just another form of current day agriculture. Remember where it's located, that was on the last slide. But the important thing here is why it's located here. These are regions where it's actually hard to produce consistently at least grains. It's hard to grow things. And so pastoral nomads, they actually roam the world. And by world, they have these set regions that they go on. They're not randomly moving around. They're going to be moving with their herds. And you can see the numbers on the screen right now for kind of what animals they'll have and how many. But they'll be moving around their own regions. Now, in some extreme situations, if there's a drought or a war, they'll move into other territories. But for the most part, they're going to stay in their own zone. Now, they will at some points start to plant. They'll plant certain grains and a lot of times leave women and children there to take care of them. They'll use these for trading. They'll also use some of their livestock as trade. And even though they focus mainly on livestock, the majority of their consumption of food is going to come from grains that they obtain either through growing it a little bit or mostly through trade with other people that they come encounter with. So remember with them, they're not randomly moving around, they're not sedentary, they are nomadic, and this is still being practiced today. We have over 15 million people in the world who are currently practicing this type of agriculture. Now, even though we have 15 million people practicing it today, this type of agriculture is actually on the decline. This is because as we see new technology, improved communication, and we also see the rise of some national governments that don't like this whole idea of people just randomly moving in certain areas, and again, randomly moving within their area, not just randomly moving anywhere. 
And so governments have started to try and take back some of this land to develop it and to use it for their own production. Some of them have worked with pastoral nomads, trying to integrate them in society. Others have pushed them out. There's a different kind of approach that's been used in each country. The important thing here to realize, though, is this type of agriculture is on the decline as the world becomes more connected and more and more land is needed. So it's harder for these people to survive. And again, the reason why they're not already just sedentary is because their land doesn't really support it. Many of the pastoral nomads, too, don't want to just change over to a new lifestyle. They enjoy the life they have. It's a simpler life, it's less stressful, and it's what they know. So there is some resistance when governments and other groups come in trying to convert them and change their lifestyle. Many of the groups do not want that to happen. The next type of agriculture that we're going to talk about is shifting cultivation, another subsistence form that is still practiced today. Shifting cultivation is also known as slash and burn agriculture, and it's made up of two main features. One, farmers are actually going to clear the land, they're going to cut down all the different brush, everything there, and then they're going to burn it. So a lot of times the machete is used to be able to cut these things down. There's not a lot of access to machines because this is subsistence, so we have not a lot of access to money or resources or connections to a bunch of different countries. The next thing that happens is after everything is burned, those ashes then actually provide the nutrients for the land. What happens then, they clear it and then they're going to plant. And they will continue to plant crops until there's no more nutrients. Then they'll leave the land to follow and they'll repeat this process. What happens here is we see villages that will be surrounded by the land that they'll be producing food on. So you have a village, they're going to decide where to produce the food, and then this cycle continues. When the land is left unchecked, it'll then grow back, and then eventually down the road, they will return to it and start this whole process over again. So let's kind of explore what's going on with shifting cultivation or slash and burn agriculture. Again, both are the same thing, just different words used to describe the same type of practice. So with this type of agriculture, the village is going to decide what's to be planted. Now their fields will look a little bit different because they're going to be planting what they need. It's not going to be as organized and it's not going to look anything like commercial agriculture. So that's important to understand. On the screen right now you can read the different crops that are sometimes produced and what's happening with them depending on where in the world we're talking about. The important thing though to also understand here is that today there's less than 5% of the world's population that is practicing this type. And these numbers are also declining. That's because as deforestation continues to happen, a lot of this land is now being transferred into the logging industry and other sectors of the economy, making it hard for these people to continue to live on. Now, there is a lot of environmental costs with this. Some people say that shifting cultivation, while it does release a lot of carbon into the atmosphere because of the burning of trees, and then also cutting down the trees, which is producing less oxygen for people, is a bad thing. It's not as bad as when the logging industry comes cuts down everything and replaces that within sedentary agriculture. So there's some debate here on whether it's sustainable or not. But one thing is sure, if you have a smaller population, they can live off of it. If the population starts to grow though, then we start to see this increase rate in how many trees they need to keep cutting down and burning to be able to feed the population. It's not that sustainable for large populations. Smaller populations, yes, it does work. However, as populations grow, this becomes a harder way of life because of the amount of food it requires to feed everyone. So some things to think about, both from an environmental standpoint and also just from sustaining the population and feeding everyone, from even like human rights and making sure people have food and access to a healthy and viable life. Now before we go on to our next type of agriculture, there's an interesting thing that has started to happen with slash and burn. And that is actually a lot of these LDCs where they're practiced, the countries are starting to realize the importance of the rainforest. And we're starting to see more of them preserve the rainforest and set land aside. This has slowed down the deforestation and has actually kind of helped some, not all of them, just some of this type of agriculture and lifestyle. Now, it's still on the decline, and we'll have to see what happens to this, but things are changing. Now, our next type of agriculture that we're going to talk about is intensive subsistence agriculture. Now, this type of agriculture is going to require a lot of people. They're going to have to produce a large amount of food on a very small amount of land. Now, in the areas of the world that this is practiced, a lot of times land is passed down through generations. And what's happened with that then is the amount of land that farmers have continuously gets cut. As you have kids, then you'll give them land. 
So they have to keep producing a lot of food to be able to support themselves and their family with a little amount of land. Now in order to do so, no land is wasted here. Roads and paths are kept as small as possible. Animals are used on the land only in certain times to help plow and take care of it. Everything else then is kept off of it. The goal here is to have also as much production as you can. And because t money is going to be scarce, you're going to see most of this done by hand. Our agricultural density is going to be high here as well because we're not going to have access to a lot of machines. We're going to have a lot of people working the land to be able to support themselves. And to maximize again our food production, we have to make sure that none of this land is wasted. That is why we're going to have small roads and paths. We want to make sure that we're using all of our land for production, not for people to walk on. So if you are on a path or a road, anything that's going to be by the arable land, you're only going to be able to walk maybe one person down at a time. You won't be able to walk with a big group. You're going to be going in a single file. And that's to make sure that you can focus on the production of food. Now with intensive subsistence agriculture, most farmers will have multiple plots of land and they're not going to be right by each other. And that's because things are getting passed down through generations. Now, when we're looking here, if we're talking about Asia in particular, we can see that Asia has actually two categories of intensive substance agriculture. And it's broken down into wet rice dominant and not wet rice dominant. Now, what's happening here, it depends on regionally where we're located and the climate of what it allows. Now, wet rice production, it happens in a variety of ways. First, it's going to start on a dry land in a nursery. Then eventually the seeds as they start to grow will be moved into a field where it'll be flooded. Today, China and India, they actually produce around 50% of the world's rice. So that's huge. Now you can see on the screen right now the steps for this. I'm not gonna read through all of them, but you can see it for yourself. The important thing to understand here is this production is going to be pretty intensive and it's focused on the labor where you're gonna have people doing everything. You're not gonna have a lot of machines. An interesting thing too is actually the rice that's produced, if the farmer is going to be eating it, they'll just kind of eat it as is. However, it's going to go to sale and it's going to be sold to the market, which will eventually go to consumers. The rice will be polished and it'll be whitened. So it is actually more appealing to the public. So that way they can hopefully sell it quicker. This actually takes some of the nutrients out, but does make it so they can sell their product. So that is used sometimes for that. And at the same time, too, we have areas that'll have a doubling time, this doubling crop, where it's warm enough that they can hopefully produce two batches, two yields per year with the same amount of land. So that way they can get a little bit more money, hopefully, or to be able to produce more food for their own family. So again, you can see the process right now on the screen for wet rice production and what happens with that. Make sure you kind of understand that for your quiz or test. Now we're about to go on to the second part of the intensive substance farming, particularly focused in Asia still. This is the one that's not wet rice dominant. So if you need more time on this slide, make sure to pause it. You can always come back to this. If you're watching live, try to stay live. Just write the time right now. So that way you can come back to it later on after the video is done. Now this next part is talking about areas where we are seeing the climate is not really suitable for wet rice production. This is located normally a little bit interior of India and China in the inner kind of northern east part. Now what's happening here is they're going to be producing other products, other crops. You can see them on the screen right now. Wet rice isn't that profitable or sustainable here. It's going to be hard to produce it. So they'll focus on these other crops instead. And one of the things that's used here is crop rotation. In order to protect their land, they'll rotate the crops to make sure that they don't deprive it of all the nutrients. Remember, land is really precious here because it is so small for each person. So they have to take good care of their land to continue getting a higher yield for their production of whatever they're producing. That way they can feed their family and possibly even make a little bit of money. So if you still need a little bit more time on the slide, don't worry, I'm not gonna move yet. But I'm gonna go into a little bit of a story on China in particular, because it's an interesting thing that happened. This happened around actually the communist revolution, where much of China's actual land, the agricultural land in particular, became under the control of the government. The government wanted to try and produce more food. And one of the things that they did is they actually instituted these uh, producer communes, where we had multiple villages all working on a large amount of land to produce food. The goal was that by having all these people working together, they would produce more food, which would increase the food supply. What happened though is in kind of an interesting phenomenon. 
people actually started to produce less food. They just started producing food for themselves. They weren't taking care of the land as well, and we saw food production actually go down. Later, China would actually remove this. They would start to get rid of the communes and remove these communities. The reason why is it turns out that when people are actually producing for themselves, they're going to spend more time to produce more. When there's some incentives there, people have more of a reason to try and overproduce or try to make a food surplus or innovate to create more and more goods or even more efficient ways of producing it. This is actually kind of similar to that second agricultural revolution where we saw the enclosure movement happen as Britain decided to start shifting away from all these small areas and these people who were all using the land to larger fields where only one person used it because then they could hire workers and they would be able to be more productive because there's incentives there. So same thing happened in China as well. So kind of an interesting thing. Our next type of agriculture that we're going to look at is now plantation farming. And then we're going to go into more of the developed agricultural types. And that'll be focusing on MDCs. So plantation farming has taken a bunch of different shapes throughout history. Today, it's where we have large corporations that are owning a farm in a developing country. They're going to be producing a lot of different products and crops. You can see them listed on the screen right now. All of these goods are going to be sent to the developed world. So they're located in LDCs, but they produce stuff for MDCs. The reason why they're located in LDCs is to cut costs. One of the things that happens here is we see an actual positive impact on migration. A lot of these plantations are located in areas where we don't have a high concentration of people. So companies will then market and advertise to get people to migrate to these areas for work. Workers will be given food, housing, social services, money, and they will then produce for the company there. Now, plantation farming, they kind of do all the production of the good there. They have everything finished and then they ship it. This reduces transportation costs and makes it a little bit easier to get to their end destination. It also boosts profit margins. Now, in the past, these were located in some developing countries, the United States being one. However, after the Civil War was over and we started to see the removal of slavery, plantation farming was no longer profitable, and we started to see a shift as it slowly declined. Today, now again, it's located in less developed countries, and they're still producing for the more developed world. So there's a pros and cons to this. One, some people say that, well, it does provide jobs for these areas, and it helps keep cheaper goods for the United States and other developed countries. Now, by keeping products cheaper, then people are having to have more money, they can get access to more food at a cheaper rate. While others say, though, yeah, the jobs that they're producing really aren't that good, and because they're having to import all these workers, it's not really helping the local economy that much. And at the same time, too, by skewing our prices, then we are getting kind of an unrealistic version of what food and things should cost, which changes our attitudes on different products. And that's up to you to decide of where you stand on this. But plantation farming definitely still happening in the world today, and again, it's going to continue probably as well. So for subsistence agriculture and in agriculture in less developed countries, we can see there's a bunch of reasons why we see certain types forming in one region but not another. Some are environmental like we talked about, others are cultural. Like for example, when I gave the example, actually the example of an example, on pork. In Muslim countries, they're not going to be producing as much pork, or India is not going to be eating as many cows because we're looking at cultural and religious impacts where it's a taboo to eat these things. That way, then they're not going to produce it. So environment and culture have a big impact. Now, MDCs and commercial agriculture, also we can see different things are produced depending on where you're located. On the screen right now, you can see all the different areas around the world and what they're producing and where it's located. I'm gonna be breaking down these six different regions for the developed world kind of bit by bit over the next, I don't know how many minutes it'll take, but I'm going to be doing that right now. So if you need to pause this, by all means pause it. I'm gonna start going on and continuing, starting with our mixed crop and livestock. And then we'll go down the list. Hopefully by the end of it, you'll be able to understand all these different types of agriculture, both with subsistence and commercial. Okay, so before we get started, you know the drill, just take a break, breathe, pause. If this is getting annoying, and I know I keep saying that, it's okay. This is actually better for you to relax and take breaks. 
Now this is very short, but when you're actually studying, you should take a longer break. This lets the information process in your mind and make sure that you can remember it. If you just study, 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 you're not gonna remember as much. It helps to take even 15 minute breaks to be able to kind of understand and relax a little bit what you're studying. Now, I'm gonna get started in just a second, but remember, relax, keep following along, ask any questions that you have in the comments below or in the chat, and keep being active. Use those notes. All right, stretch it out if you need to, move around, and we're gonna get started. So, starting off with commercial agriculture. Now, the big thing here, we're gonna be talking about mixed livestock in just a second, but commercial agriculture has changed over the years, especially in the developed world where we're seeing more and more agro-business. It's become very industrialized. Now, we'll focus a little bit on the industrialization later on in the video. But here's where we're seeing farmers are producing food for sale, not just for their own consumption. They're being producing their products, at least, for money. They want to make money. Remember back to kind of von Thunen? These are the different types of agriculture we're talking about. Now for mixed crop and livestock farming, this is the most common form of agriculture in the United States and also much of Europe. This is actually pretty profitable. And it also distributes the workload and the money throughout the year. Now what's happening here is crops and livestock are integrated together. Here you're going to have where some of the crops you produce are gonna to go to the animals as feed. The animals then are going to eat the grass in the area and then they go to the bathroom, that's gonna be the fertilizer. So everything's kind of done in house. Now one of the things is during the spring and the summer, the farmers will be growing crops. And then in the winter, they can use those crops to feed some of their animals. This way they always have things to do and then they can sell the animals for money. So manure is used from the animals to take care of the soil and to make sure that farmers can continuously both keep their land arable and full of nutrients and then also keep their animals healthy by feeding them crops that they're growing. So this is important to understand. One, the income's distributed throughout the year because in the summer you have things you can sell and in the winter as well. And the workload is as well distributed. There's never a point where you have nothing to do. This is a very demanding type of agriculture as there's always work to be done. Now in the United States, the most important like mixed crop region is from Ohio all the way to the Dakotas. The center's kind of actually Iowa. Now, with this, we see a lot of crop rotation happening, and that's to make sure that as farmers continue to plant their crops, that they don't deplete all the nutrients from the soil. So a lot of farmers will section off parts of their land and will raise and produce animals in one area, and then they'll grow certain crops in another. Then by using crop rotation, they'll keep cycling through different plants, so that way there's always arable land, and they're not depleting all the nutrients. So that helps actually promote their land and keeps it sustainable so that they can continue to produce products year after year. This also started in Europe and again goes all the way back to that enclosure movement. And now it's up to kind of a four field system. Originally it started as just a two, then it went to a three. So we're seeing more and more fields be added and then the rotation continues. This helps increase yields and also keeps the land healthy, which is really important for farmers when that's your main focus for your business. Our next type of agriculture is commercial gardening and fruit farming. Now this type of agriculture is kind of interesting. It requires a long growing season and it has to have a pretty humid climate. For the United States, we see this agriculture taking place mostly in the southern eastern portion of the U.S. One, because of the environment that they have to be able to produce this food year-round, but also because of geographically where it's located. This area has quick access to some of the bigger markets in the country, New York City being one, or just New York in general, that whole east coast. And so this farming is actually also known as truck farming. Now the reason why it's known as truck farming is this is a very efficient process. Most of the food here is not going direct to consumer. It's going to go to a store shelf. It's going to go to a market where then people will go to buy it. And in order to do that, it's pretty processed. It's gonna be canned, it's gonna be frozen, it's gonna go through a bunch of preservatives to keep it fresh or to keep it from expiring. Then it gets loaded onto a truck and it gets sent out throughout the country. It ends up on a store shelf and eventually maybe in your kitchen. So this farming that's happening is not necessarily just organic. Now, there could be different things with that. We're not gonna get into that right now. But this type of farming is being produced in mass amounts and then it's shipped out throughout the country. The goal is to always be efficient. This is gonna use a lot of machines and they always wanna keep their costs down. 
Now, one of the controversial ways that this is done is actually through the hiring of migrant workers and also unauthorized immigrants. This helps keep their wages lower, which then keeps the food prices lower and can help drive more sales. Now, recently, as we've seen more of an anti-immigrant movement and a pushback, there could be some challenges with this industry, as some of their workforce may start to get cut off. Now, only time will tell what will actually happen. Will food prices go up for these commodities? Maybe. Or, at the same time, maybe they'll find other ways to produce this food. Now, for the main crops and the main food that's produced here, you can see it listed on the screen. The important thing to realize here is this is a very efficient and productive manner of producing food. It is processed, it's going to be canned, it's going to be frozen, and it's known as truck farming because it's being sent all over the country. So hopefully this is starting to make sense of this type of agriculture found in more developed countries. Our next type of agriculture is dairy farming. Now this is one of the most important types of agriculture. And there's been some interesting trends with this type. Historically, the more developed countries, MDCs, have produced the majority of the world's dairy products. However, this is starting to shift as we are starting to see more LDCs adopt new technology and start to change into the dairy industry, where now we're actually seeing LDCs are producing more than the more developed countries. So that's kind of a recent shift within the production of dairy. Now, dairy production happens most commonly around urban areas. In the United States, it's our northeastern part of the country. For Canada, it's going to be the southern eastern part. For Europe, and the majority of Europe at least, it's going to be the northwestern part of Europe. Now, we're also starting to see it spread throughout the world as South and East Asia start to produce more and more dairy. Now, one of the big things that's happening here is with transportation and technology changes and improvements, we're seeing this ring, a milk shed ring, increase. Over time, you can see on the screen right now kind of what's happened with it. And why this is important is we are now able to produce these products further and further away from the city, and we're able to transport it to a marketplace or a wholesaler. Majority of these products are not sold direct to consumer. They're sold to a wholesaler, which then consumers will go and purchase. We sell it to a store, then they're going to buy it. People will go to the store and buy it, and then take it home. This, all these products have expiration dates, and that's why this milk shed is so important, because this is the range that you can produce your product and still be able to sell it before it expires. And as technology continues to grow and transportation does, this ring will continue to increase in its size. Now, dairy farming is actually pretty intense. It's requiring a lot of work from the farmers and it's not the easiest thing to do. Machines get used a lot here to try and help with the milking of cows, for example, but cows still need to be milked at least twice a day. And there's different things that need to be tracked to make sure that they don't get certain diseases and that they're also remaining healthy so that they can continue to produce milk. Now, over time, this can also have some hidden costs. One of it being the food that the cows eat. For example, if you're in an area where winter comes, you're going to have to figure out how to feed them. And in the winter, that can be difficult. Cows, for the most part here, are going to be eating hay or grains and it's used for winter feed. But winter feed can become costly. So not only does this take a lot of time and effort and energy from the farmer, but it also can add up their bill, which can make it more expensive to be able to produce this. That's why historically, it hasn't been only located more in the developed world. And now as we're starting to see a shift with new technology and also the diffusion of practices, we're starting to now see that transition again into some of the LDCs as they start to partake in dairy production. Our next type of agriculture is going to be grain farming. Now, don't get confused with mixed crop and livestock farming here. The big difference here is the majority of the crops that we're producing for grain farming is for human consumption, where when we're seeing our mixed crop, the majority of that is actually going to the animals to feed them. Here you can see on the screen the different crops that are produced here. Wheat is arguably one of the most important, and that's because of all of its uses and the things that we put it in, not just food, but other products that we have. Here we're starting to also see that it's becoming very mechanical and mechanized. The developed world, and actually United States and Canada, they're actually going to produce around half of the world's wheat exports, meaning they're producing a lot of this wheat and they're sending it throughout the world. Now this has started to change as other countries have increased their yields and are starting to produce more of their own wheat.
But technology advancements such as the McCormick Reaper, which allowed now the actual machine to cut down the grain, all the way to the combine, which is going to do multiple tasks at the same time, allowed this production to increase its yield and for us to be able to quickly produce a lot of wheat and other grains. One of the benefits to this type of farming too is these foods can be stored. They're not going to expire like dairy farming. So sometimes countries will intentionally produce a surplus, store it for use at a later time. And this is also where we're going to see some experiments with different things such as gasoline as they start to incorporate corn and other products into those things. So we'll have so much food now that we're not even using it just for food. It's now being developed into our products. Now for grain farming, we can see it's actually broken up into two seasons. We have a spring wheat belt and a winter wheat belt. There's also kind of a third, which is in Washington state that accounts for around 80% of the US's lentils, but we're not gonna get into that really right now. So just kind of important to understand that it's there, but we're not gonna kind of delve into it. The spring wheat belt is located around the Dakotas, Montana, and also parts of Canada. One of the things that happens here is winters are more severe. And so all crops need to be planted, planted, not planted. Planted's not a word. Jeez, these videos get long and draining. All right, enough of like the random mishaps. Let's kind of continue. So with that, we are going to see crops are planted, not planted, in the spring, and then they'll be harvested in the fall. So that will be the main growing season. If they try to plant earlier, let's say in the fall, the winters are too severe and it'll actually kill the roots. However, we have our winter wheat belt. This is located in Kansas, Colorado, Oklahoma. And what we start to see here is winters are a little bit warmer. Now you're still gonna get snow and everything, but this allows farmers to plant in the fall. A root system will start to develop. And then when winter comes, it'll actually kind of hibernate a little bit. The snow will act as an insulant, so it'll actually protect and keep it warm enough where it won't freeze. And then in the spring, the crops will start growing right away and farmers can actually start to harvest towards the beginning of the summer. So these are our main regions and kind of what's happening with the production of grain, particularly in the developed world. Fun fact, uh, planted will not be on your AP test. So ignore that slip up. On to the next thing. Woo! We're getting there. All right. Our next type of agriculture is Mediterranean agriculture. Now this type of agriculture is going to be located on the west coast of continents and it's also going to be located by a sea or an ocean. Now the reason why it's located on the west coast is because the wind that comes from the ocean onto the continent, onto land, is going to help moderate the winters. It's also going to provide moisture when it's hot and dry in the summer. This will allow production of crops, allow agriculture to actually happen and to be able to flourish. Now the land in this area isn't going to be flat like the Midwest in some of the areas that we're talking about grain farming. We're actually going to have hills and mountains here. Now where we see this practice in the world is going to be more focused uh, around the Mediterranean Sea. We're also going to see Southern Europe, North Africa, and also kind of the Western coast of North America. So for example, farmers in California and also central Chile and the southern western part of South Africa will also see this happening here. This type of agriculture will be practiced. So that's important to note. On the screen right now you can see the different crops that are grown here. And these are also important to understand. These are the main things that are produced. Some of them are foods, others are cash crops that are used to try and generate revenue for farmers. Now it should be noted that most of these crops are for human consumption. They're not going to animals. So that's important to understand as well. So unlike our mixed crop livestock, these are going for people, not for other products or animals. So just important to note that. Now the next type of agriculture we're going to get into is livestock ranching. And this one has kind of the most complicated history within Hollywood because it's Hollywood's favorite. So many cowboy movies, so many westerns. So like I said before, livestock ranching is our next form and this one became really popular in Hollywood. Now we'll get into that a little bit later on. But the big thing here is it started off in Texas. You can see on the screen some of the dates of how it changed over time. The important thing of how it diffused though throughout especially the United States had to do with economics. In Texas when it dominated we saw a saturation of the market. So ranchers were only getting about three to four dollars per cow. So there wasn't a lot of incentive to continuously ranch and raise these animals. But what they noticed is if they were to bring their livestock up to like let's say Chicago they could get thirty to forty dollars a head. And so they started to diffuse. We started to see a movement as now that became more profitable to sell to other parts of the country. 
So the Hollywood kind of made this into kind of an obsession. This is where we have the cowboys, the ranches, you have the Wild West. And while some of that may be true, well, most of it wasn't, this started to take on as kind of a phenomenon. And we'll see a couple different things come up with this in this type of agriculture, particularly with the range wars. And that's where we see a lot of Hollywood movies kind of based off of. So today what we start to see is a lot of this is more in the western part of the United States. That's where we see more of ranching happening today. And actually a lot of it is where we see the government is part of this now. The ranchers are actually going to be renting the land from the government. And what happened is, and the reason why it changed to this, is there used to be this thing called the Code of the West where ranchers could move around with their cattle, they could go wherever they wanted to, and they didn't have to ever own land. So it was relatively cheap to be able to raise this livestock. But as the United States started to develop more sedentary agriculture, farmers started to get a little bit more frustrated with all of these cows and these different cattle coming onto their land and eating their food, drinking from the water, and so they started to put up fences. Ranchers then started to retaliate by cutting down the fences or putting up their own fences and they started to have these range wars back and forth. What happened then eventually is barbed wire became introduced and that is what won it for the farmers. They started putting up barbed wire which started to cut off access to ranching and as the United States started to shift into more sedentary practices and the more production of grains, the government then bought a bunch of land and would rent it to ranchers in the future. So today most of this is going to actually take place on government owned land where ranchers are renting it from the government. This then helps keep their costs down. And so at the end of the ranch wars, well, the farmers ended up winning and the conflict was kind of over. So ranching, we can see, has changed a lot over time. So commercial ranching isn't just practiced in the U.S., it's practiced all over the world. But the important thing to realize is this has continued to evolve over time. We went from cowboys and ranching to open where you could go wherever you wanted to, down to the range wars where they lost land. Today, now over 60% of ranching is actually happening on government-owned land to now the next evolution has started to happen, where we're starting to see the industrialization. So we're moving from grass-fed cows, cattle, free range, to then confined spaces, all the way up to industrial agro-business, where now we're getting into CAFOs, confined feedlots, where some have said we're no longer producing just animals, we're actually just producing food. We're becoming this meat processing industry rather than this economic activity for small local people or for individual farmers. And that's gonna transition us into a new phenomenon that's happened, which is industrialized agriculture. So industrial agriculture is used a lot in the developed world, particularly in the United States. You're not gonna have really a follow period, so you're not gonna be letting the land sit there and get nutrients back. You're going to be focusing on producing high amounts of food. And now when we're talking about cattle going off ranching, we see the development of CAFOs, confined animal feed operations, where we're seeing a lot of animals placed in small places. The goal is to raise them fast, quick, make them as fat as possible, then you would do the killing and be able to sell it to the market right away. Costs are trying to be kept relatively low. Part of this is actually because of government subsidies. Now, a lot of times corn and other grains are gonna be used here. And because the government has subsidized them, meaning they're actually given incentives to farmers to produce these products and keeping the cost at an artificially low rate, it's made it so these CAFOs can use this food, they'll pay less for when they normally would have to, and then they can mass produce cows, pigs, whatever it may be that is being produced on the CAFOs. We're also going to see a lot of antibiotics used here, and that's because of the high concentration of animals. There's going to be a lot of diseases, so antibiotics are used to try and keep the animals healthy. We're also going to have a lot of chemicals that are used in this. This is in very industrialized agriculture. Now, we have a lot of machines happening throughout this process. One of the issues is because animals are contained and they're kept in small areas, we're not going to be seeing the benefits of like mixed crop livestock farming, where the animals, when they go to the bathroom, that's then fertilizing the ground, and then they're getting crops fed from that land. What's happening here is the land isn't as arable anymore, so the animals will be sitting in their own feces. Manure is going to be everywhere, so they'll have to be cleaned. They'll also have to have more antibiotics, and even the finished product will need more chemicals put in it to try and counter E. coli and salmonella, other things that have started to come up due to this new system.
So government has kind of supported it through subsidies and American consumers and the developed world in general have supported it by continuing to purchase their products because their prices are cheaper. We're using less land now to produce more food. So and that's one of the reasons why this form of agriculture has become more popular. And while ranching, which uses a lot of land and takes a lot longer to produce food, has kind of started to die down. Now with this type of agriculture, we're starting to see more oligopolies and monopolies form. You don't have to worry fully about what those are yet. That will come up later in our economic unit. But what's happening is the industry has been consolidated. We now just have a couple of companies that are controlling the whole thing. And there's a lot of environmental impacts that are occurring because of this type of agriculture. And the big one has to do with manure. I've already mentioned how the animals are sitting in their manure and they are now being coated in it and it's not healthy for them. And now we need to use more chemicals and antibiotics within their feed, within the animals and the finished product to make it healthy to eat. And how this has also introduced new forms of bacteria like E. coli and salmonella that have started to be introduced. I mean, even in the world today, just look at, if we just talk about the US for a second, how many things are being recalled. Over Thanksgiving, all of romaine lettuce was recalled for the entire country. The CDC recalled it. That's massive. We are seeing a lot of these recalls on food and it all has to do with E. coli. A lot of that is coming from this more industrialized system where we're using factories to mass produce our food and we're seeing some outbreaks now of things that we normally used to at least not have. Other things to think about here, and you can see all the little fun facts on manure, is the runoff. What is that doing to the environment, to the water source, and to the air quality? As we see higher rates of ammonia, as we start to see higher concentrations of manure, and all these transportation costs. There's a lot more CO2 being put into the atmosphere when we have to have all these trucks deliver food to these CAFOs. Where if it was mixed livestock farming, then you're just having all the food grown there. So check out all the fun facts, all the manure fun facts. You can see the sources and stuff there. They're not really that fun, but maybe kind of interesting. And again, too, antibiotic resistance has started to occur. We can even connect that all the way back to our wonderful unit on population, where we looked at stage five of that epidemiologic transition model, the evolution of disease. Will we possibly have a new breakout that could actually kill a lot of people and we won't be able to cure it? Who knows? But the evolution of diseases is happening partially because of our system of food and how we're producing it. So some things to think about in terms to the industrial agriculture system. Continuing off these environmental issues, as the world continues to see increased climate change, one of the big contributors to it is actually this type of agriculture. You can see on the screen right now different statistics and sources from the EPA, from the UN, looking at what's actually happening to the world and how this type of agriculture is impacting it. Now, at the same time though, it's not all negative. This type of agriculture lets us feed a lot of people. We're able to now produce a lot of food at a very cheap rate, which gives more access to food to people who maybe couldn't afford it before. We also see these CAFOs and these industrial systems that are opening up in communities provide jobs for people who need work. It provides them healthcare benefits and can hopefully provide them a quality life. Now, some do argue that these jobs aren't always the best, but that's for a different topic and another day. So again, Positives here, more food, cheaper food, more jobs can help local economies and can also just support the country in general. And when we have a world that is struggling to need food and people are starving, maybe this is a way that we can produce more food and help people out. So that's gonna be up for you to decide though. I'm not gonna get into that right now. The next part of this video though, we're gonna get into some of the challenges that are occurring with some of these different types of agriculture because there are a lot of challenges. We've already identified some, but now it's time to actually make sure that you understand them all specifically. Okay, before we get into the next part of this video, it's time for a brain break. This one's gonna be a little different. I got jokes, agriculture jokes. All right, let's go for it. So why did the pig dump her boyfriend? Quality joke right here. Because he was a real boar. Oh, that's great. Okay, second joke, oh, we we'll only do a couple. Don't worry, we'll get back. This is healthy for you, you need to break. Uh, what did or sorry, what do you call a cow with no legs? Ground beef! Ah! All right, okay, one more, one more. I know, this is amazing. Okay, let's go with, what did the mama cow say to the baby cow? It's pasture bedtime. Oh, 
I crack myself up. Wonderful ja dad, ja dad jokes. Anyways, this has all been Agricultural Brain Break. Remember, stay active, have questions, ask me, comments, chat, whatever it may be. You can do this. This is a lot of information. Stretch it out. I know I need to because my arms are literally getting tired, which is really sad. Too much of like this motion. Okay, enough of me talking and rambling now. Time to relax. We're going to get back into the content. Hopefully this break's kind of helped you out. All right, let's continue on, shall we? To the challenges of farming. So the big challenge right now for subsistence agriculture and for LDCs, less developed countries, is producing enough food for their growing population. Remember back to our population unit when we talked about that stage two. We're seeing population growth here. So they are seeing a lot of people now being born and we're also seeing more people moving to urban areas, which puts more stress on farmers in these areas to trying to be able to produce enough food. So in order to meet the demand, they need to adopt new styles of farming. They need new techniques, they need new technology, and they need to be able to create more output to feed the population. Now this is becoming hard to do. And one of the things that was discovered is by Esther Borsup, which I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that name, so I do apologize, uh, a Danish and French economist who actually studied agriculture development. And you can see the chart that was created identified kind of five stages. This is what started to happen as society started to evolve in subsistence agriculture areas. One of the things that you can see on the screen right now is that follow period, the time of when you're letting the land sit, becomes shorter and shorter and shorter. And we start trying to produce more and more. So we're putting more stress on our land. That physiological density starts to go up because we're having more people, we're having a higher population, we might be having more people now moving to urban areas, which means we have to have more people working the land. And by doing this, then the goal is to hopefully be able to support these higher densities, these larger populations. Now, this isn't always the case though, because there's some other challenges that are happening besides just trying to physically grow enough food and also maintain your land, as you can see through the chart, how it's evolving. As we saw from that chart, the goal is to try and produce more food for our population. Now, one of the big issues with this is that as we continue to try and feed everyone, we need more money to be able to buy new technology, to buy new fertilizer, better yielding seeds, and that requires capital. And for us to get money in a less developed country, farmers have turned to actually producing goods to sell to the more developed countries. This then in turn gives them some money. Now the hope is that they'll start using that money to then switch back and produce food for their own country. One of the big issues that's come up though is as farmers have switched to producing food for the more developed countries, their own countries then are losing their farmers because now they're producing food for another country. And countries that are already struggling to feed their population are now continuing to even struggle more because their farmers are dedicating their arable land to the production of food or products for another country. And so this cycle starts to form. Now, one of the biggest challenges for recent I guess a couple of years, has been food prices. We started to see food prices have gone up. Food prices have actually doubled between 2006 and 2008. And the United Nations kind of looked at this problem and attributed a couple factors to it. One, we're having poor weather conditions. It's being harder to produce yields that are high as we see our climate continue to shift. We also see a higher demand for food. Remember, all these countries that are in stage two of that demographic transition model, they're having more people and more people need more food. And when more people are putting a burden on the food, well, we're going to see those prices go up. We also are seeing smaller growth in productivity. We haven't had an agricultural revolution in a while. A lot of our yields have kind of topped out. So we're not seeing this increase like we have in the past. And crops are also starting to be used for a variety of other things. We're no longer just using all the food we produce for food. They're going to animals, they're going to biofuels, they're going to other products like your shampoo or batteries. And so we're seeing our food be sent to other places. And all of this has continued to put more pressure on the developing world and also some on the developed world as well. As food prices have continued to go up, governments and LDCs have tried to fix this problem. They realize they're having more urbanization and they have to feed these people. Because if they're not going to feed them, they're going to have a lot of issues. And so what they've done is they've tried to actually limit the amount that food prices can go up. They've set price ceilings in effect. Now, a price ceiling is just a maximum amount that a company, or in this case, a farmer, could sell a product for. So let's say it is at 
$5. If I price ceilings at $5, I cannot sell my product above $5. Now the goal of this is to make it so food is cheaper for everyone. That way everyone can afford their food. Because if prices keep going up and people can't afford the food, then we have other issues. Now one of the things that has happened because of this, and you can see it on this chart right now. Now this is a supply and demand chart. There's no reason to freak out. We'll be getting into this more in our economic unit. We talked about it in our population unit. I keep introducing this because it's a different way of thinking. Hopefully by the time we get to econ, you'll kind of have a good understanding. But we can see that we have our demand and our supply here. Now on the chart, one of the things that's happening is we can see where our equilibrium is. That's where our X marks the spot. This is where the market wants to be. At this price point, this is where we want to actually sell it. We would have the same supply as demand, which means we have no shortage or surplus. What that means is that everyone who can afford the food and wants to buy it will get some. And everyone who's willing to produce it will also sell all of it. Now, if I set a price ceiling, that line is going below the equilibrium. I'm artificially lowering the price of that product. When this happens, my demand will go up. People want to buy stuff when it's cheaper. And what happens then to our supply? Well, our supply goes down. These farmers, for at least this example, are already struggling. And now when I say they have to sell their food for even less, well, there's less likelihood than that they're going to try to produce more of it they're gonna turn more to developing food for the MDCs or other things there. So we will have a shortage because our demand is going up, more people can afford the food now so they are gonna be buying it, but our supply is going down. So there's not gonna be enough food for everyone. This will cause more rates of hunger. We're also going to see the farmers get hurt more, which is going to force them out of that industry or force them to sell to other markets. Hopefully that kind of makes sense. If you have questions on that, make sure to let me know. The important thing is to understand why this is happening. This chart just explains some of the implications of these governmental policies. Now they're put in place for good intentions, but there's other consequences. Whenever you manipulate the market, there's a lot that goes on. Now we're gonna go on to the next thing, which will be looking at some other challenges for these LDCs and some of the creative routes that they've gone to try and address them. So like I said, one of the big challenges has been for farmers to get enough money. And as some of these countries have started to put price ceilings in place, farmers are having to turn to other ways to produce revenue, to be able to buy new machines, to be able to afford to actually just buy the seeds. And one of those solutions has been drugs. On the screen right now, you can see cocaine, heroin, marijuana. These are the most commonly ones that we've kind of talked about. Uh, we'll get into the opioids as well. And you can see all these on the screen. You can see some of the different things of where they're produced, what they look like, and also where they're sold to. Now, the important thing here to realize is that the developing world is actually meeting the demand. They're selling to the developed world where people are wanting to consume and purchase these drugs. These are been actually a way for farmers to generate a lot of money. And that is why we're also seeing increased production of these drugs. Even though the developed world has had a war on drugs where they've been cracking down, because the demand is there and we have a bunch of different regions in the world that need money, they're going to supply it. In some areas, governments have actually been promoting it because this is a way to get revenue into their country and to support their citizens and to also help out their farmers. So this has been kind of an interesting twist or an unintended consequence to some of the agricultural problems. Again, though, this continues to exacerbate one of the biggest issues, which is now we're having land, arable land, go to the production of drugs in developing countries where they need this land to support their population. And these products are being sold to developed countries. And so they're not then producing food for their own area, their own country. But they need to do this because their governments don't have enough money to help out these farmers to be able to have them produce for their own country. And so this cycle has continued over the years and is still going on today. Now in the developed world, they also have some challenges. Now they're a little bit different than the developing world, but still these challenges are significant, particularly for the farmers that are being impacted by them. One of the big issues that MDCs have is we don't have a shortage as much anymore. We have a surplus of food to the point where actually this has lowered farmers' incomes. Because we have so much of a surplus, some of the products are not selling. This is also then driving down our prices. When we ever have a surplus, the way to get more people to buy it is to lower prices. 
Now, one of the issues with food is we have so much of a surplus in developing, in the developed world, not the developing, that we are starting to see that consumers really aren't increasing their demand as much anymore. So prices can only go so low. And when the prices are going lower, the farmers are getting less of a return. So consumers do change their habits based on price, but when, at least what we've been seeing now with food, is you can only buy so much food. So you're kind of peaking out where price is lower, that'll increase demand a little bit, but not enough to actually generate more revenue. So in countries like the United States, the government has actually stepped in to provide certain food policies to help these farmers out, to make sure that they can be supported. Now, one of the things that's happened with this is some controversy where farmers have said, well, they've gotten the short end of the stick. The government was supposed to support them along with the people. Now, not in handouts or something like that, but to be able to make sure that they can afford their lifestyle and to be able to sell their food at a very reasonable price that benefits consumers, but also provides them with a stable income. Some of the ways, at least, that the United States government has helped out farmers is by actually stepping into the market. They will actually promote the fauna. Some of the ways that the United States government has helped farmers is by helping them with the follow period. They'll actually promote people and farmers to, hey, take a break, don't grow anything this year. Maybe plant some cloves so nutrients can go back into the ground or rotate these crops. Governments have also set prices for farmers. So what they'll say is, hey, at the end of the season, if prices drop below this point, we'll pay you the difference. This adds a little bit of security to farmers so they know exactly what to expect at the end of the season for what they'll get. And at the same time too, the government has used some of the food surplus to donate it to other countries as foreign aid, as donations, or even using the food stamp program to try and support and promote the production and, well, not necessarily production there, but the purchase of certain food types. This has helped reduce surplus. So in the developed world, the governments have stepped in to try and alleviate some of these issues. Now the ironic thing here is the developing world, their issue is they don't have enough food and so their farmers have had to turn because the governments can't support them financially to selling products to the developed world. Where the developed world has actually gotten to the point where they have so much food that they're telling their farmers, whoa, slow down, stop producing so much, and they're giving food away or they're having them, they're actually paying them or offering incentives to slow their production down. So the two, it's kind of ironic of what's happening between LDCs and MDCs. Hopefully the challenges to farming now are kind of making a little bit more sense. There's a lot of other ones, but these are the main ones that we've focused within our class, the unit, and also in the textbook. The next part of this video is gonna be talking about sustainable agriculture. This is becoming more and more important in society as we've seen it become kind of on the rise. Now, sustainable agriculture is agriculture that strives to promote good quality food with minimal impact on the environment around it. Now, it does this with three main factors, limited chemical use, sensitive land management, and also integration of crops and livestock. So, kind of like that mixed crop livestock farming that we talked about earlier. Now, while they may have lower costs sometimes, they're also going to get lower revenue. That's why it hasn't necessarily caught on as mainstream. This can be sometimes expensive. Most of the time you're trying to actually limit your expense, but because of that then, you might have a higher workload. Now, let's get into what some of the things that are happening with sustainable agriculture and how that's impacting farmers today. One of the ways that sustainable agriculture can help farmers is by taking care of their land. And one way to do that is the ridge tillage system. On the screen you can see a bunch of different information about what's happening here. The important thing to understand with this system and what's happening is farmers are actually going to create these ridges. In between them is going to be where the tractor, the tires, or where any of the foot traffic goes. Then on the ridge, on the peak of it, is where you'll plant your crops. This is going to help kind of keep the soil less compact where you're growing your crops, which allows air, which allows worms and other things to occur that keeps putting nutrients back into it. It also minimizes where everything is going to be compacted, which can make it harder to produce crops. Now what happens over the years is as they continue to grow crops, they will then cut down their harvest when they're done with it, and they'll let that go back into the earth. And so it'll decompose, putting the nutrients back in. And so by you doing this, you can conserve water as when it rains, it'll go into kind of the tills into down the ridge, which will then help take care of the plants. It'll reduce the amount of chemicals that are needed. It makes it easier for weeding. And it also kind of reduces some of the work for farmers. 
Now it can be a little bit more time consuming as you're not gonna be using as many chemicals and things like that. So it is a little bit more hands-on. However, once the system's up and going, it can actually reduce some workload for the farmers. And it also benefits the wildlife around it as earthworms are able to come in more, which will put more nutrients back in. And we'll also have more water, more birds, and more wildlife that'll be able to occur. So since the green revolution, we've seen an increase in chemicals and herbicides, herbicides being chemicals that are used on plants. Sustainable agriculture strives to eliminate this or limit them as much as possible. By doing things like ridge tillage, we start to see where farmers don't need to use chemicals as much. Weeding is done more by hand or also by machines. Again, the goal is to limit the chemical use. That will hopefully produce better quality food and also reduce the impact on the environment around. One of the big issues with agriculture is when you're spraying your different herbicides, when you're putting chemicals down, one, if you're doing it by air, it's going into the air, then it gets on the ground, and then when it rains, you have runoff, which gets into the lakes and the oceans and the wherever may be, a pond, and that creates other issues. So by limiting it, we can have more sustainable systems that hopefully produce still quality food, but at the same time too, don't have as big of an impact on the earth around us. The next part of this type of agriculture of using more sustainable means is to make sure you're integrating your livestock with your crops. By having the whole system in one area, it actually makes it so you can produce more food and make sure that you're using less chemicals. Since your livestock will have to poop, that poop will be used as manure to fertilize the environment around you to make it so you can get higher yielding crops. Now there definitely are things here that farmers have to worry about and also think about. You can see them on the screen right now. Anything from how many animals to have, because the more animals you have, particularly confined, means they're going to have to continue to eat more. They're also going to poop more. And so do you have enough land to support those animals? Managing their feed, managing the different things, especially with climate as that's changing, and also even just how the markets change for prices and what's going on there. So you can see everything listed on the screen right now. What happens is a lot of farmers actually kind of section off their land. So you can look at any of the videos online. There's a ton of them, and they're kind of cool, of where they'll rotate the cows. So you'll have all the cows in one section. You'll have them fenced off. They will graze, eat everything there. Then you'll open up another section of your land. They all move in. This area has been left untouched. Then they would consume and eat that area. The cows are cutting the grass, they are consuming the grasses as food, then they are pooping, which is acting as manure, which is then fertilizing the ground, and this cycle continues. Then later they can be sold off as a profit, and then you also have arable land that's occurring. So some things to think about with sustainable agriculture. All right, we're almost done, so just hang in there. We have one more thing to talk about, and that's the world's food supply. Take a break right now, relax, process everything. I got a couple more wonderful farm jokes, agriculture jokes to lighten the mood and the tension. If you've made it this far, congrats. This is a really long video. So let's get into a couple little jokes and then we'll finish up this video. All right, joke number 10 on this list. What did the girl mushroom say to the boy mushroom? You're a fun guy. Oh, this one's great. Okay, what's the potato's least favorite day of the week? Fry day. Get it? Because they go in the fry and then they turn into fries. Oh, classic. All right, let's just continue on with the video and start to wrap this up. Hopefully you're feeling good, it's not too stressful, and you're starting to understand things. If you're liking the video, hey, why not subscribe too? It helps the channel and helps me produce more of these giant, massive videos. Now, on to the world's food surplus. Almost done, hang in there, you can do it. When it comes to the world's food supply, we have this ironic situation. We've already referenced it, it's the MDCs are producing too much food, they don't know what to do with it, and our LDCs are not producing enough food. So we have this issue happening. Now we have four main strategies that these categories are pretty big, so there's a lot of things that fall into them. But we have four main categories, these strategies, on fixing this problem. One, increased exports from countries with a food surplus, so sending it out to other countries. Two, expanding agricultural land. Three, expanding fishing. And then four, increasing our global productivity. Now, some of these are easier than others to do, and some of them are pretty big. Remember, there's a lot of ideas that'll fit into each of these categories. So with our first strategy, one of the things that we can see that's already happening is people are trading more and more food between other countries. Today, our global food trade is over a billion dollars. 
You can see on the screen right now kind of where the majority of the trade is happening. A lot of products are moving from the Western Hemisphere to the Eastern Hemisphere. So you can see the breakdown on the screen. I'm not going to read all of it for you right now. You can look at this on your own time. One of the things though that has occurred is the United States has dominated for a long time the export of grains. Now that's because of some of the different laws that the government has put in place. However, recently we've actually seen this start to decrease. The United States production of exports has gone down. And one of the big reasons why that is, is because other countries now are able to feed their populations. Remember all the way back to the start of this really long video where we talked about the Green Revolution and that miracle wheat seed that let India start doubling their production? We've started to see now with yields going up, other countries no longer need to import food because they're able to start to support their own population. This is a great thing. Not necessarily for American farmers who have relied on that, but we'll start to see some transitions occur within our own economy and the world economy as a whole. The second strategy is actually just increasing the amount of land that we're using for agriculture. Today, only around 11% of the Earth's surface is being used and cultivated for agriculture. Populations are continuing to increase and we need more food to be produced. Now, one of the issues with this though, is we're starting to see some changes, both in our climates and also where people are living. Decertification is starting to happen, where areas that are overgrazed, overproduced, so we're actually growing too many crops, are losing all their nutrients and the land is starting to die off, particularly if you're located in areas where it's more of a dry, arid climate. So we're starting to see arable land turn into the desert. We're also seeing some areas that are becoming over flooded where we're having too much water that they're not actually able to then produce any food from there. And in other areas, we're seeing urbanization occur. So for example, the United States, we've lost over 200,000 hectares of prime agricultural land. This is land that is best suited for agriculture to get the highest yields. And so this is an issue. However, we're starting to see more things like vertical farming and urban farming start to happen, which will hopefully try to counter some of this. So there's still plenty of time and hope for the world. But one of the things that people are trying to figure out is how can we produce more food with the land we have now and also maybe even create some new ways of producing food that can reuse some land that currently, at least as of now, can't produce food. A lot of people actually believe that we don't need to look to land to solve our problems. We need to be looking to the sea. Fishing could actually be a solution. One of the things that started to happen is aquaculture, where we're starting to see controlled cultivated seafood. And the benefit here is you can actually then produce and grow fish inland. So you can gain access one to fresh fish throughout a landlocked state or a country or just within communities. And this will also help counter some of the overfishing. One of the biggest issues with fishing right now is we'll have too many people fishing in an area, it becomes overfished, and we are starting to see some of our populations like tuna and swordfish decline by over actually 90%. This impacts the food chain and can also help, well, cause some issues down the road. Now, one thing with this though, is we right now have about 18 fishing regions. If more advancements start to happen with aquaculture and be able to develop it more inland, we might start to see more of a shift to farm fishing, where you're no longer having to go out into the ocean. Now, this can help feed a lot of people. And a lot of people are looking at this as a way to produce more food that is a cheaper cost and can feed more without having to then worry about putting more of a burden on the land. Now, it's still in development and it's being practiced already, but it hasn't necessarily hit that mass production yet. Now, with fish at least though, fish has started being consumed at a much higher rate, even surpassing meat now, and by meat I'm meaning like cows and beef. So fish, depending on how you classify it, a lot of people don't classify it as meat, others do. So it's kind of up to you on that. Our last strategy of just increasing the food supply is simple, increase productivity. Now, it's harder than it sounds, but a lot is being done already by using robotics within actually just self-driving tractors to GPSs, to drones, to tracking what's going on with cows wearing Fitbits, well, Fitbit-like things, to all of these innovations with technology to try and produce more food and to try and reduce also our environmental impact. We're also seeing new techniques being used with vertical farming in urban areas, even just growing food on top of skyscrapers in buildings, both lowering the cost of heating the building and producing fresh vegetables and fruits and other food in maybe a food desert or for a local community. 
We're also seeing a lot of research trying to build off of what happened in the Green Revolution, from cloning animals to actually just producing meat in a lab. Now, there's a lot of other implications with that and a lot of controversy there. But the big thing is we are continuing to push the boundaries, development of new fertilizers and other things too that'll help us increase our yield. All of these will hopefully create a world where we can feed our population. And even if we continue to grow as a human species, we'll be able to hopefully produce enough food for everyone. And at the end of the day, that's what counts. Producing enough food for everyone, trying to make sure that we are producing also a quality life for the people who are producing it and the people in the countries, supporting our environment and just creating a better earth. You just did it. You did it. You're done. You don't have to watch anymore. I hope this video helped you out. Thank you so much, especially if you've watched the whole thing. I know your time is very important and I know this is a very, very long video. Right now filming it, I actually am a little bit scared of how long it's going to be. I still have to edit it and put it all together. So I hope this did help. If you have any questions at all, post them in the chat if you're watching it live or if you're not, post them in the comments below. Again, I cannot tell you enough how much I appreciate you taking the time and watching this video and hopefully learning something. If this did help, please hit subscribe. It does help my channel out, it helps support it, and it helps it make it so I can make more of these videos. If you have any questions again, let me know. I'm Mr. Sin. We just watched a really long video on agriculture. Hopefully it helped you out and good luck on your AP test. Until next time, I'll see you online.